Recording in progress. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Deep Math Conference on uh, the mathematical theory of deep neural networks here in uh, sunny California. Uh, my name is Mikio Aoi. I'm faculty a, and a uh, faculty member here at UC San Diego. Uh, and within today's hosting institution, the Holly Jolu Data Science Institute. Uh, and I'm a co-organizer of this conference. And on the behalf of the organizers, I want to thank you for coming here today to share your work and pushing the frontier of uh, our understanding of deep neural networks. Um, uh, if you want to catch past and uh, uh, if you want to catch any of the talks that you missed during this conference, uh, they will be posted to YouTube um, eventually. Uh, we have all of our past talks posted there right now, and they already accrued uh, over 34,000 views. Uh, I want to acknowledge my co-organizers for this committee, uh, for this uh, conference. Uh, this is a fabulous group of people uh, to work with. I especially want to acknowledge uh, Gal Mishna, who has done an outsized role in organizing this conference. Yes, please. Um, so this is um, a number of firsts for this conference. Um, I would like to call them the, the five firsts of, uh, the, f the five fifth deep mass firsts, although there are only six, there are six of them, but I, I thought the alliteration was funnier. Um, so this is the first in-person event that we're having since 2019. It's the first held on the West Coast. It's the first in hybrid format. It's the first held with protesters outside. Not yet, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, uh, it's the first to immediately follow a 30,000-person conference on the other side of town. Um, and it's the first to broaden the scope of talks to include societal impacts. And in particular, uh, I want to focus on this for just a moment. Um, I think most of you would agree that the work you do at this conference is central to the development and understanding of modern machine learning algorithms. But this community can play an equally important role in guiding the social choices that arise as machine learning is deployed. In light of this responsibility, DeepMath is committed to fostering dialogue between people working on the technical development of these technologies and those with a broader view of how they're being implemented. As part of that effort, we're including a keynote talk on this subject this year for the first time, and we look forward to Burke's talk and to more to come in the future. Um, so regarding the protests, um, if you didn't know, um, academic employees across the UC system, including here at UC San Diego, are currently on strike. Um, uh, to negotiate better working conditions, and this includes graduate students, postdocs, uh, RAs, TAs. Uh, picketing is taking place across campus, uh, and some street access uh, could be impacted. Uh, we have no interest in interfering with these protests, and we're not aware of any safety concerns uh, uh, related to the protests, but they could impact today's schedule and accessibility options for the poster session. So just to give you an idea, this is a picture from my office window. This is a street that's being blocked off by picketers here. Um, they're mostly just chanting and playing pickup basketball. Uh, so pedestrian access, oh, I should mention, just to the left of this building over here is where we will be going to our poster session. Uh, and you'll be walking down this street past the picketers here. Pedestrian access shouldn't be affected, but we'll keep you posted as things develop. Um, vehicle access may be impacted. For those of you um, who need help getting there, we do have a, a shuttle provided, but um, uh, that this access could be impacted. So if you do think you're gonna need help getting there, let us know well in advance, because we may need to find an alternative route to get you there, all right? Um, Regarding COVID, uh, we are following campus policy regarding masking uh, here at this conference. Masking is not required, but it is strongly encouraged. Uh, masks, test kits, and hand sanitizers. Uh, I believe you have hand sanitizers at most tables, but um, all three of those things are going to be available at the registration desk. So if you have any uh, thought that you might have any symptoms or even a uh, suspicion that you've been in contact with someone with COVID, feel free to just grab a test. You can just ask the people at the front desk. Uh, if you experience any symptoms at all, uh, please be considerate of the health of your colleagues and leave the building. Um, I'd like to thank this year's sponsors. 
uh, the Halijolu Data Science Institute of the National Science Foundation and the Johns Hopkins Mathematical Institute for Data Science. Uh, and in, a, in an effort at shameless self-promotion, I just wanted to mention that uh, HDSI is hiring. Uh, we have five open searches for um, uh, faculty positions. Three of them are at the assistant professor level, uh, jointly appointed with other departments. One is a teaching professor position, and we also have a, uh, a tenured position uh, with a, um, a broad topic search. I especially want to thank um, three people associated with um, HDSI for which this conference would not be happening. First, our uh, distinguished professor and founding director, Rajesh Gupta, uh, Jennifer Morgan, who uh, runs everything and nothing would work without her, and especially Olivia Navarro, uh, the a faculty assistant, miracle worker, and all around badass. And we would like to um, give her a token of our appreciation here. And please give her a round of applause. It is, uh, it is, it is no exaggeration that this conference would not be happening without her. Thanks. Uh, and with that, I'll bring up our first session, uh, session chair, Adam Charles, to introduce our first speaker. Hi, Francis, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, it's a little on the weak side. Um, can we? I can. Maybe I can try see... again? Hello, hello, this is Francis. <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we're a tad bit ahead of schedule, but um, I will start the introduction and uh, we will just have a little bit more time uh, with you. So. Uh, Thank you for, for joining us, uh, Francis. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Francis Bach, a professor at INRIA and the Department of Informatique de l'École Normale Supérieure. Uh, he is a giant in the optimization and learning areas, um, having published extensively many uh, important foundational advances um, from him and, and his work. Um, for example, his recent award of the NeurIPS Test of Time Award for his work on online learning for latent Dirichlet allocations. Um, Dr. Bach has had multiple prizes, including the Lagrange Prize. He is a member of the French Academy of Sciences. And we are honored to have you as our uh, opening speaker for DeepMath 2022. So uh, if you want to share your screen and we can begin. Okay, thank, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, can you can you see my slides correctly? We can. Thank you. Okay, I can. Okay, and uh, let me just rearrange my. Uh... Okay. All right. So um, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. So I wish I could be in San Diego. Uh, it's dark and rainy in Paris right now. Uh, it seems like very sunny and very jealous. But the good thing that I've managed to bring uh, some of the French spirit uh, to San Diego with the protests, which are quite common in Paris. And so I hope uh, it goes OK for you. So today I'm going to talk about topics which are not deep learning. Uh, so I think maybe a good break uh, for some of you. And whether it is deep or shallow, I will, I will let you be the judge uh, of it. But at least what I can say is that it's a topic which I have worked on since my PhD. And in fact, when I finished my PhD in, uh, in, uh, in Berkeley, I had left something open which I didn't really like. And I think I'm getting closure on, on this topic uh, 20 years after. So good take-home message 
always keep some problems in the back of your head. Sometimes you find new, new toys and new tools and you can provide new solutions. So today I'm going to talk about information theory and uh, kernel methods. So as a disclaimer, it's not ready for deployment yet in large scale applications. Okay, so the idea is more like defining new uh, sets of tools that hopefully would be useful, but uh, as of now they are implemented, but not in large scale settings uh, yet. So also uh, feel free to interrupt me uh, during the talk. I think since we have some time, I'd like to keep it uh, as um, uh, interactive as possible. All right. So um, what would be the goal? The goal of today? The goal of today will be to measure distances between distributions, between the probability distributions. And this comes out in many places uh, throughout um, machine learning data science. And so here are a few examples which I'm listing. Like a classical one is the model fitting. So you, you minimize the distance. So here distance will be in quotes, okay, they're maybe not metrics. Uh, the distance between uh, the unpack distribution in your model and you get model fitting and most uh, uh, generative modeling techniques have end up being of that of that kind you minimize some distance and the choice of course you have to choose you have to choose the correct model but also the correct distance but sometimes you may want to measure uh, independence for example if you want to do feature selection you want to measure independence between uh, uh, give the feature some like some variable in the, in the, in the label. Also in other like uh, setups, when you add noise to your data, for example, for privacy issues, you may want to measure how much you lose uh, um, when adding noise. And also when you want to quantify uncertainty. So th this comes up like in, uh, in many places, uh, having uh, distances between distributions. So why is it uh, difficult? It's difficult because we are not dealing only with Gaussians and uh, discrete random variables. So if if you have Gaussians, then everything is easy, okay? If you have like discrete random variables with only a few uh, outcomes, it's also easy. You compute the probability mass functions and you look at any book uh, and you use the distance. Okay, the difficulty that you want to apply this to uh, continuous uh, uh, sets with obviously uh, non-linear dependencies. Okay, so this is a key, a key difficulty. The other difficulty that we want a distance which you can estimate from data. Okay, so this is like the least we can hope for machine learning uh, application. And what I will add, what I would like to do to add today is I would like to have some physical or uh, statistical meaning to the, to the distance. It's not only a number, it's a number which I can give to an engineer and the engineer will understand what it means. And I'll come to that in a, in a moment. So for doing this, there are like many ways of doing it. And I will uh, review like three classical frameworks. Uh, the first one is a classical information theory, okay, where you, uh, so this is for a finite number of outcomes. Uh, you compute, take P and Q, being defined by the probability mass functions, and you sum uh, p log p over q. This is a classical Kullback uh, Leibler divergence, which is like non-negative and uh, uh, will characterize uh, will be zero if only if p is equal to q. But it has more than that. It also it has some nice invariant properties by reparameterization, and it has strong uh, physical interpretations. Okay, so as in terms of communications, like number of bits. Uh, to encode P with Q or Q with P, I always forget. Uh, also, it has some strong link with uh, probabilistic inference, okay, with uh, through duality. I will come back to that uh, later in the talk. But the issue is that for discrete problems, it's very simple. But as soon as you move beyond discrete or Gaussians, then this is going to be uh, more problematic. Ah, then another uh, uh, more slightly simple. More recent and it's like a wide use within machine learning is a optimal transport, uh, where the idea that you compare two distribution is P and Q by moving mass from P to Q and trying to minimize the distance that you uh, that you um, that you have to move. Um, so this is somewhat physical because you have the distance D, but uh, I I've asked around, I've asked around, and it's 
unclear what the meaning. So people use this a lot to do algorithms, and so, but the meaning of the value is still uh, is still a bit unclear. So uh, uh, so of course, Pierre and Couture did not invent this, but there's a nice book uh, explaining like various applications. So what I will mostly focus on uh, today is looking at distributions like uh, distances based on moments. Okay, so what the moment is have a feature map phi that, go, that goes from my input space X to some Hilbert space H. So you can think of H as being RD if you wish, but D will be uh, infinite uh, in a moment. And I'm characterizing uh, probability distributions P on X through the uh, mean element, which is just the expectations of phi uh, under P. So mu P will be the mean element. So typically, if x is in R, in R, you can put in phi of x, 1, x, x squared, and you get the classical moments. So what is nice about this is that if you include, uh, it's well known, if you include sufficiently many moments, then you will fully characterize the distribution. So if mu p is equal to mu q, then p has to be equal to q. And this has led, uh, particularly if you use the Hilbert space uh, structure and the Hilbert norm, to the classical maximum mean discrepancy, which is essentially the uh, uh, norm of mu p minus uh, mu q. So why is it nice? Well, first, it does characterize distances. So this is you can do learning with this uh, and be consistent. Also, uh, if you only know, only know uh, mu p or mu q, like p or q through uh, ID samples, you can estimate with a convergence rates in one over root n. So you don't see here are the curse of dimensionality, which you see in many uh, of the other distances. And uh, if you don't want, if you want to work in high dimensions, okay, with D being very large, and if sometimes potentially infinite, because you only need the kernel uh, Q of X, Y, which is the dot product between phi of X and, and phi of Y. Okay, so it's very nice. There's a good uh, uh, tutorial paper by uh, Muanda and colleagues, and this very much like all uh, distances between probability distributions, there are applications in model fitting, independence tests. You can do GANs if you want uh, 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 with them. But what I've always uh, felt unsatisfying with those like distances is the link with any form of information theory or, or physics. Okay, so you compare moments. Okay, so if you put like x square and x cube, Okay, sure, it, it does uh, characterize the distributions, but what does it mean, okay? What does it mean to have a value of 0.1 of that distance? Okay, so the goal of today is to try to extend uh, that uh, type of framework, so based on moments, uh, and have explicit links with uh, information theory. So the summary of what I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, on, that, on those two slides, or maybe one. So the idea is to go one level up, so not consider only moments of phi, but uh, moments or expectations of phi times uh, phi transpose. So here, phi star uh, will simply be phi phi star is the rank one matrix, if you're in the infinite dimension, uh, 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 whose elements are uh, ij is phi x, phi x i and phi x j. So it's a rank one. Uh, matrix. If you are in the Hilbert space, it's an operator, but let's let's see it as a, as a matrix. Essentially, uh, the uncentered covariance matrix of the feature phi for the for the distribution p. So we know nice things about that uh, matrix. It's always like symmetric or positive semi-definite, and uh, uh, and we're going to not use a square norm between. Uh, Sigma P and Sigma Q, we could use the Frobenius norm uh, or the Heber-Schmidt uh, norm, but we're going to look at quantities which are uh, uh, closer to information theory. And in fact, we will use uh, quantities coming from quantum information theory. And uh, we'll start with the von Neumann entropy, which I will define precisely uh, uh, later, with the trace of Sigma P of Sigma P, and the associated uh, relative entropy. And once you use those quantities with that definition, then things start to be interesting. Okay, and this is a topic of a paper which was it's now published at the information the actually transactions of in, information theory. And the the what I'm going to describe now in this talk is first it has a direct relationship with information theory. It's not simply 
it looks like it, like a strong, uh, strong link, maybe like a lower bound on those on the true quantities. But then you preserve the nice things about like the maximum mean discrepancy MMD by having estimation in one over root n. And I will show how can this be used uh, in uh, multivariate modeling and also in a uh, virtual inference. So this is the plan uh, uh, for today. And if you want uh, to know more, you can simply look at the online preprint. All right, so let's uh, go down to the bias definitions. So I'm going to consider a positive subunit definite, a positive definite kernel, okay, default on x times x. So here, also one of our goals, uh, which I forgot to mention, is that x can be anything. And this is the beauty of a kernel method, is that x can be discrete, x can be rd, x can be the set of graphs, x can be an image, x can be anything. I will provide examples in RD because it's concrete, but this is a way to extend uh, information theoretical quantities to any uh, any set. So we characterize everything through the kernel, K of X, X. So your PSD, your P, uh, positive definite kernel, if you, uh, if all the uh, pairwise, uh, uh, the metrics of pairwise evaluations are all a PSD, and we're going to assume X is compact and the features are normalized. So all the features have, have norm uh, less than one. So, um, so it's it's known that as soon as you have a kernel, you have some uh, feature map phi of x. Okay, so I could have started from phi and defined k, but here I chose to look at k and define phi. Okay, as soon as k is a positive definite kernel, you know there exists a feature map phi that goes from your input set x to some potentially large Hilbert space, so that uh, uh, k of x, y is phi of x times phi of y. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, if you prefer, I could have started from phi. I start from k because since I want to consider phi being infinite dimensional, I don't want to compute phi. So we only access phi through the kernel metric, through the kernel. Then what is typical in that setup is to consider the space of linear functions in phi. So uh, f of x would be f dot product with phi of x. So it's a function of x, which is which is linearly parameterized uh, by f, and that defines functions on the edge, and this is what people typically use in uh, kernel methods. Okay, and for those uh, uh, for that set of functions, it's uh, the kernel is said universal if uh, that set of function is dense in the set of all functions. Okay, all continuous functions with uniform norm. And essentially, all like the classical kernels, like Gaussian kernel, exponential kernel, and so on, uh, do, do, do satisfy that. So for those kernels, phi is infinite dimensional, okay, and you can characterize uh, all functions. So as I've mentioned, the Gaussian kernel here is infinite dimensional, but uh, uh, we will consider other kernels as well uh, today. What will be important is the notion of scale, uh, sigma, is often kernel. Uh, come uh, from the notion of scale, okay, depending uh, scale the input space, and sigma will be the length scale associated with our kernel. So let's give some uh, other concrete examples, and I see to, to me this is the one which is my main motivation because everything is easy for this one. So if you take like, the cube, uh, the torus, your one to the d, and you consider like translation invariant kernels, then uh, um, you can, uh, everything is defined uh, through the Fourier transform. And here, because we are the torus, it's a Fourier series. So indexed by omega being, uh, having integer values. Uh, and if you take that kernel, you can see that kernel as phi of x times phi of y for that phi of x. So the feature is indexed by all integer vectors. Okay, and this is just a complex exponential. Uh, they are missing a 2 pi here, sorry. The complex exponential here, uh, plus a times a scaling vector. And that scaling uh, uh, scaling factor, and that scaling factor is here to uh, make everything sum to 1 or be less than 1. Okay, So if you compute the norm of phi of x, the square norm of phi of x will be the sum of all q hat of omega. And we're going to assume this is less than 1. Uh, so essentially, we're going to consider like infinite, infinity many frequencies. The cool thing here, now you can look at what the uh, covariance operator is by computing uh, uh, the, the element omega omega prime, which is obtained by 
omega omega prime here, and I see appearing so q hat of omega, q hat of omega prime coming from omega prime, and by using the fact that I have complex exponentials, I get the expectation of a complex exponential, and this is a classical characteristic function taken at omega minus omega prime. So essentially, in that moments uh, you you get all the uh, you get all the classic characteristic function, not coded at a line, but coded uh, through in a, in a PSD matrix. Okay, so it's a particular way of uh, 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 displaying and storing uh, the characteristic function. For example, you can typically compute a Q for many Q hats. So if you like to have uh, exponentially dec decaying uh, spectrum like this, you can compute K, you can compute Q directly. But this applies to any set, and I think finite sets are also important because they provide intuition for what we want to do. And if you use a finite set, it's a diagonal. Okay, so this is important here. In the simplest setup, finite data, we are just doing a very fancy way of storing P into diagonal of matrices. But we'll see that this will be crucial in a moment. So some properties of that covalence operators. So uh, first, it is uh, well, positive semi-definite. It's, it's straightforward from the uh, definition. Phi, phi, phi star is a PSD. So the trace is less than one because I've assumed that the norm of phi is less than one. And uh, because I have so a trace class operator, I have a sequence of values going to zero. And uh, since I've assumed, and I will assume it uh, from now on, that the kernel is universal, then the mapping from P to sigma P is injective, essentially in the same way as the mapping from P to mu P was injective. Okay, in fact, this is just mu P for a particular feature. Okay, so this is just like replacing a kernel by the square kernel. Okay, so everything that which is true for the mean element will be true for us. Okay, at the moment, I have not used the uh, matrix structure of the problem. Now, let's now use this uh, matrix, uh, matrix uh, structure and let's define the negative entropy. So this dates back from uh, von Neumann in the 30s. And so we are going to consider a, a spectral function. So trace of A log A is simply uh, computing like lambda log of lambda for all eigenvalues of A. So this applies as soon as A uh, as, as, uh, is uh, diagonalizable. So A being symmetric uh, or Hermitian. We assume that all the operators or matrices are uh, positive. So log lambda is, is well defined. So give me an operator or matrix A. If you know the eigenvalues, and there may be infinitely many, okay, if you are if you're in the kernel case, then you sum lambda log of lambda and you get the von Neumann entropy. Uh, so here you can check that if you take A being a uh, jack P, if you take that case, okay, so the eigenvalues of sigma p are just the diagonal element, and the sum of lambda log lambda is simply the sum of p log p, and you get the regular entropy. All right. <clears throat> now, oh, first, this is a convex function, okay, uh, because the trace of f of a, when f is a, a convex function, is always convex, okay, so we have a convex function, so we can, it's differentiable, it is strictly convex, so we can define the Riemann divergence. And uh, this happens to be uh, the relative entropy. Okay, so it's not obvious. So you have to take phi, C of A being the trace of A log A, compute uh, uh, the gradient. So you have to know about the gradient of spectral functions. Essentially, it's uh, log A, and then uh, by log A plus uh, some constants. And, and then you compute the Riemann divergence, and you get uh, something like that. And uh, in our situation where often things will be normalized, the trace of A will be one, and the trace of B will be one, and you recover a trace of A log A minus trace of A log B. And this starts to look a bit like uh, the sum of uh, P log P over Q. So a few, a few properties of that relative entropy. So this is very well studied in the quantum world, that like most of the results come from uh, quantum, mechanic quantum physics uh, uh, papers. So some of them are uh, obvious coming from a, a in, from a convex optimization perspective. So the fact it is like non-negative, it's obvious because it's a Riemann divergence. So it's always non-negative. 
in security, uh, your liquidity, if and if A is equal to B, is also obvious, but a direct consequence of uh, being a Bayman divergence. So this one is simple. The complexity in A is also a straightforward uh, consequence of the definition, because all Bayman divergences are always convex in the first argument. What is not at all uh, straightforward is the fact that the uh, um, it is jointly convex uh, uh, in both uh, A and B. Okay, so this is uh, totally non-trivial. The proof okay. there are many proofs. I've put one uh, in my paper, and the proof is interesting but totally non-straightforward. And for those who like like optimization and, uh, and uh, probability. This is used a lot in the very nice uh, tutorial by Joel Trop uh, on the matrix concentration inequalities. So for all of you, by the way, or used any of those inequalities, they are based okay, on this joint complexity of this of this uh, relative entropy. And very nice book and very nice set of results. And this is also often used in optimization. Uh, the way to do smoothing of diagonal values and also nice paper by uh, Venkat, Trangasekaran, and, and colleagues. But today it's not about optimization of uh, our statistics. It's about like uh, applying this to my uh, 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 covariance matrices. All right, so let's do what I said I would do. So I'm going to, uh, to define the kernel relative entropy as this quantum thing on sigma p and sigma q where sigma p and sigma q are the covariance uh, operators. Okay, so this is the, uh, uh, this is the, that's how I see some protests outside. They want to get in? Interesting. Uh, are, you, are you still following me or? No? It seems so. <laughs> okay, okay, so let, let's, let's move on, okay. Uh, uh, so the um, yes, yeah, so you you take sigma p and sigma q, which are your covariance operators for p and q. And you just apply the formula of the von Neumann relative entropy, and this defines some notion. Okay, this is like this is simple. The question is, what does it do? So a few properties. Uh, first, you can this is well defined if. Uh, P and Q are reasonably nice. So, for example, if you have some derivative of, we have a bounded density uh, of P uh, relative to Q, you're finite. It's always non negative by construction, and it's always zero if only if this is zero, and this is zero if only if sigma P and sigma Q. And because I've assumed that I know the mapping from P to sigma P is injective, this is only equal when P is equal to Q. Okay. One nice property that it is jointly convex in P and Q, and the reason is because D is jointly convex in sigma P and sigma Q, and since sigma P and sigma Q are linear in P and Q, you preserve joint convexity. So those are the simple uh, uh, properties. But what I want to uh, uh, focus on is on relationship with information theory. Oh yeah, also if you prefer to have no entropy, okay, then you can do it, but you have to be careful with normalization. Uh, and so I'm not going to cover it today. You can see more details in the, in the paper. All right, so maybe a spoiler. Uh, I will present many uh, similarities with a classical shell and entropy, but there have to be a difference, okay? Because if I share too many properties with the, with the shell and entropy, I am the shell entropy, okay? So you, Something will uh, something will break down, and I will come back to that later. So uh, let's look at what it is for the uh, for my example with the finite set with autonomous embedding. So remember that for that set, sigma p is simply diag of sigma p. So everything is diagonal. So another way of putting it that all uh, uh, matrices can be uh, diagonalized in the same basis. So all those like log uh, of matrices will be easy uh, uh, to do. And then uh, the uh, relative entropy is exactly the classical cleavage like blood divergence. Okay, so it's important that the if I use autonomous embeddings, this is only true for autonomous embeddings where 
if x is equal to y, the norm is uh, phi of x times phi of y is one, and zero otherwise, then I get the exact uh, entropy. The question is, will it be true beyond finite sets? And the, it, it won't be true, but uh, it will be, I will replace this by some bound. So let's prove uh, that result, okay, that uh, this new quantity, D of sigma p sigma q, is a lower bound of the true uh, Shannon relative entropy. And the proof will fit in one slide, and uh, it's quite simple, and suggests an application of Jensen's inequality. So this is a definition of D of sigma p sigma q. This is sigma p. This is sigma q written as an expectation of uh, p times the uh, randomly coding derivative of q with respect to p. Okay. And now what I have is I have a convex function taken at an expectation here, an expectation there over the same distribution p. And because I'm jointly convex, I can use Jensen's inequality and get this inequality. So I get the expectation over p of what is inside there, boom, and what is inside there, boom. Okay, so for this, I do need the joint uh, uh, convexity uh, with respect to the two uh, arguments. And once I have that, I start to be in good shape. So why am I in good shape? Because now I get two matrices there and there, and this one now is rank one with all other values equal to zero except one equal to the uh, square norm of phi of x and the eigenvector is proportional to phi of x. And this one is just the same, but rescaled by a positive number. Okay, so now I can look at all the zero values. They will not count because I have lambda log of lambda, they all disappear. And I just have to focus on the eigenvalues associated with the with phi of x. All right, so I have those two matrices. And uh, uh, now uh, this had a value phi of x squared. Okay, this has a good value phi of, x, uh, phi of x squared times dq over dp. And now I'm just using the fact that uh, uh, the volume entropy is trace of a log a minus a log b. So this is uh, a log a part in blue, and the minus a log b, this is a blue part with the green part over there. This is just an equality uh, here because I'm just applying this to that along the, the joint eigenvector for the two matrices. And now uh, I'm done because I can cancel phi of x, okay? And I can use the fact that phi of x is less than one. And I get that all the phi of x disappears and I get the integral of p of log of dp over dq, which is exactly the uh, shell entropy. Okay, so here I've shown that I get always a lower bound on the true entropy. And the key here is to uh, realize that the uh, no assumptions except this one. I need normalized features, okay? And uh, apart from that, this is always true. Okay, so this will be true for all kernels in the whole setup. Of course, and I will come to this now, is that uh, there are some there are some inequalities there. So this one is not really a problem because often we use normalized features, so you get equality there. But you get, like, of course, an inequality there by Jensen's inequality. And in the paper, we look at the, I look at the um, equality, uh, equality, uh, equality situations, and you can you can check uh, the paper if you want to know more. And the question is, how tight is it? Okay, because I know a very simple lower bound of the entropy, which is zero. Okay, so zero is less than DPQ. And zero is not very useful as a, as a lower bound. Yeah. So let's look. And so here, I'm not going to give like all the details because the proof is not two lines anymore. Well, it's only five lines, but we won't do it on the, on the slides. And what you can show is that, uh, so if you take now P of Q, now you have to put some assumptions. So I'm going to, um, for simplicity and to make my life simple, I'm assuming like strictly, strictly positive densities with respect to a joint uh, uniform measure of some kind. And then I can show that the, the difference between D of PQ, which is the true relative entropy, and the new one, is always non-negative because of the previous slide, and is less than 
a product of two quantities, one which is depending on the regularity of P and Q, and one which is the quantity characterizing how far the embeddings are from uh, orthonormal. Okay, so the quantity is a, a quantity, you can, see that, you can check in the paper. And of course, when phi is, you get totally orthonormal embeddings, delta is zero, and you recover the equality from two slides ago. But uh, uh, you please provide uh, some, uh, some bounds. The, so I had a proof for that, which was like 12 pages long and with like lots of constants. And uh, I realized that you could get like a direct proof using quantum information theory directly, using the fact that for quantum systems, you can define, you do have a form of data processing inequality. And by using this form of data processing inequality, you can derive a bound of that, which is like, which you get very, very in a quite simple way. So if you want to know more, you can look at the paper. So for my examples in the, in the torus in dimension D, so what do you get? So what you can check, you can compute the various quantities for the essentially the kernel with a length scale sigma. Okay, so um, then you can show that the difference will go to zero as sigma goes to zero. In a sense, that's normal because uh, when sigma goes to zero, x minus y over sigma will tend to either uh, infinite or uh, yeah, so will be uh, this will be infinite or, or zero, and since k is typically uh, de decaying, the kernel will be either zero if you are different and one if you are equal. So when sigma goes to zero, typically there's a Gaussian kernel. When sigma goes to zero, you you end up going closer to orthonormal embeddings. So you get uh, a dependence, which is uh, and the decay square and the semi surprising fact is that it doesn't depend on dimension. Because the distance, the big O, has dimension factors, but not, uh, not the dependence in sigma. Right, so now we know we have a reasonably close approximation. Now can we estimate it? Okay, so now we know we have a link with information theory, but this relies on computing eigenvectors, eigenvalues of infinite dimensional operators. This is, starts to be a bit like complex. But can you estimate from data? And the answer is yes, using like classical algorithms. So the idea is to estimate the whole thing. I will only focus on the difficult part, the trace of sigma p log of sigma p, and uh, because it's already interesting. So now we're going to be very uh, non uh, creative here. We're simply going to replace sigma p by the natural estimator of sigma p which is sigma p hat, which is the empirical covariance matrix. Okay, I just, if I have data x1 to xn, which are id from p, I just take the empirical average. I could add sigma p hat and just replace uh, sigma p by sigma p hat, and I hope for the best. So the first uh, nice uh, part is that you can compute it, okay, because sigma p hat, it's still an operator in infinite dimensions, so it's still hard to compute, but it turns out that in exactly the same way as for kernel PCA, the eigenvalues of sigma p hat are exactly the one of k over n, where k is the kernel matrix, which is n by n. And so, um, so this means that uh, the volume entropy of sigma p hat is the one of k over n. So now you need simply well, simply to compute the eigenvalues of the kernel matrix and compute the computer quantity, the sum of lambda, uh, log of lambda. So it's still like, it's not, it's not fast, and it's n cube, but then you can rely on like 20 years of uh, algorithms in kernel machines to lower this from cubic to n with many various techniques, but the kernel, uh, column sampling. All right, so we can compute. Fine, but does it estimate the correct quantity, which is not totally obvious because uh, sigma p log of sigma, when you have sigma p log of sigma p, you have the log of lambda. Okay, so when lambda goes to zero, then this may blow up. It turns out it doesn't, and so uh, there, are, there is one quantity which is controlling the convergence rates. So for the experts in color methods, uh, then this is uh, often called the uh, maximal leverage scores, okay, for the regularizer with the regularization lambda. And essentially, the quantity that controls 
estimation uh, performance is the integrated leverage scores, and it turns out that this quantity is finite as soon as the decay of eigenvalues of sigma is strong enough, typically one over k4, something like that. So this is like, uh, uh, this show that if you have a stro reasonably strong decay of eigenvalues, then everything is fine. And you get like an estimation rate in one over root n, which is uh, nice because you don't see here uh, uh, the curve of dimensionality appearing. Okay, so C is the constant. The C will depend on, I will show in a moment, C will depend on dimension, but the rate of convergence, the uh, power in n uh, does not. One surprising aspect is that at least to estimate trace of sigma p level of sigma p, you don't need to regularize. So I don't exactly, yeah, I was a bit surprised when I saw that, but. Well. So let's look at the torus for the, for my, just to make things a, a bit concrete for that particular example. So then you can compute C and C is of the order sigma the minus D. Okay, so now you pay, you pay, uh, you pay a price for sigma. So remember that if you want to approximate the true relative entropy, you need sigma to go to zero. So C will explode. Okay, and now, uh, so if you put sigma over there, okay, then uh, you get uh, uh, an estimation rate proportional to uh, this. So there is a mistake. It's a sigma to the minus D here. I don't know what's happening. So I should correct, uh, sorry about that. And now what you can play, uh, you can play, uh, you can play games by trying to see which sigma you should need, uh, you should use if you want to estimate the true entropy. So we have the bias of sigma square, where the variance of that. So if you choose sigma correctly, depending on N, you would get an, an estimation of the true entropy. And if you do that, uh, if you do that, you end up with a rate, which is, power of n, the minus two over d plus four. So now we see the curse of dimensionality because we get the one over d. It's not optimal, okay? So for the same assumptions, like regarding regularity, you can show that the optimal thing is a square of what we have, okay? So we are not optimal, but uh, I was pleasantly surprised that my goal was not to estimate the true entropy, uh, but that we recover something which is uh, uh, reasonable. Right, so like a very basic simulation just to show that this can be run at least in dimension one and there are others in, more, in higher dimensions but in one it's easier so i'm increasing the number of samples so classical like uh, verification of your theorem you increase the number of samples you look at the entropy estimate in black this is a true shell entropy and uh, in blue and red it's here with two uh, values of the bandwidth so a large value, a small value. With a large value, uh, the convergence to the n infinite is a bit is a bit quicker than for a large for smaller value. This is consistent uh, with the bound. Uh, if you look at where they converge, uh, they get more or less close to the true entropy. So of course, with large sigma, you're further away. So that's normal. So you converge quicker but further away. And you converge from above, so this is just like a consequence of genetic inequality. And so you see that uh, you do get uh, estimation of the uh, entropy uh, uh, when uh, you get uh, more uh, examples. All right, so now let me move on to uh, what we can do with it. Okay, so now what we have, we have something which we can compute to measure uh, distances. So at this point, wherever uh, you were using MFD, you can use this one instead. I don't believe it's going to change much in the uh, performance, but at least the, the value that you will get will be a, a bit more uh, calibrated uh, with respect to entropy. And I know this has been used by uh, people uh, for uh, differential privacy to get a handle on the true loss of uh, a true lot of information. But what I want to uh, focus on for the last part of the talk is on other uh, applications, what we can do with it. And the first part uh, is essentially, this was my PG thesis 20 years ago on trying to measure, uh, to characterize independence uh, between random variables. 
And so uh, what I was doing, and which is not what I'm doing now, what we're doing with Mac Jordan like 20 years ago was essentially to uh, uh, you take uh, CMAP in CMAQ and we're essentially uh, using the uh, Gaussian entropies uh, of CMAP in CMAQ. What, what do I mean by Gaussian entropies is considering that sigma p is the covariance matrix of a Gaussian with mean zero and variance sigma p. And then if you do that, okay, so if you do that, the Volumen entropy, you don't, you, don't, you don't do this, you end up with a one half of log depth of sigma p minus one half of log depth of sigma q plus one half of tres of sigma p, sigma q minus one, or a variation of that, okay, you get a log depth and the classical like maximum likelihood type of formulas for Gaussians. And if you do that, you don't get uh, what, I've, what I'm showing here. There's no upper bound, lower bounds, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and so the links are not there, okay? Moreover, uh, uh, what we are doing when you had like two Gaussians was to uh, consider uh, uh, the concatenation. Okay, we, have, we had two Hilbert spaces, H1, H2, and we consider phi of x, which is phi of x1, x2, as being phi of x1 and phi of x2. Okay, so concatenation. This corresponds to taking the sum of kernels. But it turns out that if you want to do things like in a proper generality with all results that uh, extends, you have to replace the sum of kernels with the product of kernels. And that corresponds to replacing the concatenation of features by the tensor product of features. So now what I have is if uh, phi one is, is of dimension d1, phi two is dimension d2, I map big thing in dimension like phi one, uh, d1 times d2. And now what I have, I have a covariance operator on the joint space, I have one on the single space, and the other one on the other single space. And now I can try to, to use my information theoretic quantities to see if they mean something. So you can define the mutual information, which is the Quebec level divergence between the joint distribution and the product of marginals. And you can do this with our kernel operators. And what you could show is that it's not negative, that's direct, but it's equal to zero if only if you are independent. Okay. And for the what we had 20 years ago, we also had that. But this was not true beyond the two-dimensional case. So we can extend to all number of uh, components and could define the mutual information in the, multi in the multivariate way. And we still, st this is still true. And this is this was not true for what we had before. Then uh, you may try to uh, uh, also characterize conditional independence, and this is where things break down a bit. So I won't have time to talk too much about it, but this is where things break down, okay? And so uh, we have some form of a data processing inequality. So if you marginalize, you lower the, the relative entropy, but we cannot say that it's equal if only if the conditionals are equal. So that would be something. Right, but what I want to uh, finish on is on the uh, use within uh, probabilistic inference, and this is through duality, okay? So one, I've already mentioned it uh, earlier, is that why do we like so much, but do I like, I like so much entropy? Because it has a very rich uh, convex duality structure, and this is what is written here, is that if you take essentially the Fenchel conjugate of the Quebec library with respect to the first argument is a log partition function, okay? So which means that if you take any function f, you look at expectations of f under p, minus the kullback Kleiber divergence between P and Q, Q being a free distribution. Then if you optimize over uh, P, then you obtain the uh, log partition function, which is the log of the exponential of E of F of X DQ of X. It's often called the it's normalizing constant of the Gibbs measure. And uh, so this is used a lot within like uh, probabilistic inference. And you can look at the book by uh, Martin Wainwright and Mark Jordan. And so, uh, so wherever, whenever you need this, you can access it through uh, the Quebec Library. And now, since we have lower bound on this, 
we obtain upper bound on that. Okay, so essentially, whatever I describe will provide uh, upper bounds uh, on the log partition functions. And when I have conditions under which this is tight, you get conditions under which this will be tight as well in the other setup. So this is a, a direct, you replace a P and Q, okay, by D of sigma B, D of sigma Q. And this gets really powerful if you uh, take uh, functions F, uh, which are quadratic forms. Okay, so quadratic forms, then uh, these expectations only depend on the trace of H times sigma P. And now this one can be comput computable by uh, semi-definite programming. Okay, so here, uh, so here, uh, this is convex in sigma P, this is uh, linear, so it's a convex problem, but you still have to be able to solve it. It's convex, you can solve it, and you can look at the paper to know uh, a bit more. Okay, so here I'm just like showing that you can extend all of that to virtual inference. So simple example, okay, 1D, it's just to show that you can solve that problem uh, in simple cases. So I take a simple f in 1D, I get a value for the log, log sub x functions, and I'm taking few of x between like a finite basis uh, here, and I increase the number of basis elements uh, here, and I take various sigmas, okay, and uh, I always get upper bounds, this, uh, this I know, and uh, as I, I get more and more frequencies, I converge to the true log partition function. Okay, so just to not verify, but illustrate the fact that we get upper bound. All right. So one thing which is uh, uh, interesting, and is for in fact the motivation behind that work, is to add a temperature. Okay, so it's classical to add some temperature epsilon. So if you put an epsilon over there, then you replace the classical log sum x function by epsilon log of f over epsilon. And it's known that when epsilon goes to zero, so this goes away, this will convert to the maximal value of f, and that log sum x will convert to the, to the maximal value of f. Okay, so this is a, in fact, people often use this as a way to smooth the maximum. Okay, question is, do we get similar things for kernel entropies? So let's do the same. You add a, a parameter epsilon here. And uh, now you can play around with uh, uh, convex duality. So I won't do the details here, but you can check that. You get the convex dual of that. You see a log sum x function, but in the uh, uh, spectral way and uh, uh, that kind. And when you let the uh, parameter epsilon go to zero, you end up with a nice, uh, an explicit limit, which is the uh, infimum of the largest value, the largest eigenvalue of M whenever you can represent F as a, a quadratic form. Okay, so this seems like hard to interpret, but in fact, there's a strong interpretation for that problem. And let me check how you can interpret this. So I'm going to uh, assume that the features are normalized. Okay. And by just playing around with the definition of lambda max, okay, and I won't do the details, so you have to trust me on this one, is that uh, uh, I can, can show that this is equivalent to minimizing C such that f of s can be represented as c minus uh, phi of x a times phi of x, okay, when a is PSD. So here, what do I have here? Uh, what I have here is a so-called uh, sum of square uh, relaxation of the maximization of f. So I knew that for the regular entropy, this was like an approximation of the maximi maximization of f. So this should be related to the maximization of f. And it turns out it does. So you say f is c. So that quantity is positive, okay, because a is PSD. It's a sum of squares, okay, because a is a, if you take the eigenvalue decomposition of a, you get uh, you get a sum of squares. So f if c minus a sum of squares. So f is less than c, and you try to minimize c. So here, what I end up doing. Is I'm trying to minimize an upper bound on f, okay, where I replace c minus f being positive by c minus f being a sum of squares. Okay. 
And so this uh, uh, shows that uh, what I'm presenting today is the probabilistic uh, uh, version of sum of squares, okay, with log sum x instead of uh, full maximum. And uh, the kernel thing, we did we did work on it with uh, Alessandro Rodi and Ulysse Matoferre. But of course, this dates back uh, to Lasser and Pario and, and many uh, other researchers. So uh, if you want to know more, uh, you can look at the various uh, the various papers. So if you like some of squares and you like probabilities, this is for you. All right. uh, a few extensions before uh, finishing. So what I learned in my PhD with Mike Jordan is that if you have an, a lower bound, you should try to maximize it. Okay, it's the beauty of lower bounds. Okay, it's the beauty of variational, variational inference is that uh, uh, you optimize the bounds and you always make progress. Okay, so this is can we do it? Can, can we do it here? So we have sigma p sigma q is a lower bound. So you want to maximize. Okay, and what can you choose? You can choose a kernel because sigma p is the expectations of phi phi transpose. So if you take an, another phi, which is normalized, you maximize, you get a better one. Okay? And a bit of magic here, it turns out that this quantity is concave in the kernel. And so it's, it's a well-defined uh, problem. And in fact, a full disclosure, I thought it was convex. And while showing convexity, I in fact uh, use Jensen in, in the incorrect direction and prove convexity, but in fact, I had proved concavity. Yeah, so it's just like, be careful. Okay, sometimes uh, you or you end up using Jensen in a, <clears throat> in the wrong way. All right, so it's concave. So now you can maximize. You can maximize it. And for example, if you have some known features for X, you can try to uh, risque the features with the PSD matrix. And now the kernel is a, it's a linear parameterization of the kernel. Phi of X lambda phi of X. Need to check that this kernel is still like uh, bounded, but it's still a linear constraint in lambda. And you can maximize that quantity in lambda. And this one is convex in lambda. Okay, so this one is not, okay, it's not trivial to me. This is convex in lambda. It is convex in lambda. Okay, and I provide algorithms uh, in, the, in the paper. Uh, and if you do that, the simple simulation, you do converge quicker. Okay, so if you compare to the Entropy estimate with a fixed sigma, okay, like in blue, in blue and red, and you optimize the kernel, you do a bit better. Okay, so it's just a way to, um, it's a way to learn the kernel. And the good thing is that in many uh, applications of kernel methods, you, you always have the choice of kernel, which is always annoying. Okay, and here uh, we know uh, we can choose it by maximizing the lower bound. Right. Uh, let me skip that. Let me uh, talk about a few extensions. Uh, first, if you don't like KL, I don't know why you should not like KL, but if you don't like KL, uh, then uh, if you don't like KL, then uh, you can, this can be extended to all F divergences. So this includes KL, the square Hellinger, Pearson, K square, everything works the same. Uh, now, if you know about quantum, uh, Information theory, okay, I didn't know before starting this work, and some colleagues told me um, that there are better divergences than trace of L log A minus log B, and which is always higher. And since we look at lower bounds, always higher is always better. So we can also use that on quantum entropy. And uh, let me skip that. So you can look at the paper to see to know more about this. Okay, so to conclude, I like to um, so I try to present how you could uh, use a classical moments formulation to uh, have direct relationship with uh, uh, information theory and in the form of, of a lower bound, and uh, so this allows us to get lower bounds for the entropy, hence upper bound for the log partition function. So as I've mentioned uh, earlier in the talk, it's not ready for deployment yet in large scale applications. Okay, and so we're currently uh, working on so large scale. Here is a bit like overselling. It's like reasonable scale algorithms. 
But to me, what I like in the, uh, here is the fact that this opened up uh, uh, the machinery of information theory with well-defined bounds to many uh, types of, of data. So I have like a few uh, preprints and a blog post, and this I will thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that. Um, so a quick uh, update um, that you've been hearing a bit about. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is not one of the stated locations of protests on campus as far as we had known. Um, however, that has changed. Um, they have a right to be there. Um, that is the, the current situation and they had expressed interest in staying there for a while. So we will uh, attempt to uh, carry on um, as best as possible. So thank you all for your patience um, and there will be a bar later today. Um, <laughs> More free drinks for all participants. Yep. So um, with that, um, I would like to open up for questions and we do have microphones so that we can hear each other and, uh, and that Francis can hear us as well. So uh, if you have a question, then we'll bring this around. Any questions? Really feels like France now. Nice. Hey, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question on the kernel learning that you presented at the end. Mm -hmm. Don't you risk, uh, if you optimize for the kernel, isn't the best kernel the orthogonal, sorry, the orthogonal one, where every feature is orthogonal to every other feature? Because it's the best lower bound because you get the chaos. So don't you risk going there and then you're cursed by dimensionality? Very good, Florentin. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So, of course, uh, since we have an overbound, if we maximize it, we end up with a hot level embedding, but then you typically do it with a constraint. Okay, so you have two types of constraints, and either you have an explicit uh, feature size, which you, want, which, which you don't want to go above because of uh, computational um, limits, or because if you know if you estimate from finite data, you don't want to go into overfit uh, if you estimate things from finite data. So this is where the, uh, this is true if you want to estimate, but for the log sum x function, so for entropy, I agree. Uh, I lost my, for entropy, I'm moving more. For entropy, I cannot go back to my. Uh, for entropy, um, I agree, but for log sum x, for this one, okay, uh, it's it's not it's not the case, okay. For this one, it's really a computational law. This one, a computational constraint, okay. So you're going to uh, add as many features as you can uh, to get to get closer, okay. And so typically, you're bound your your you have a computational constraint, number of features, and with a, with a given number of features, you want to do as well as you can in terms of value. Yeah. But you, you made you made the valid point. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any any more questions? Yeah, Rene. Hey, Francis. Uh, thank you. Great talk. One of the constraints you need to impose is that the PDQ is larger than alpha, and when you approximate uh, with the finite data, the, the one over alpha shows up in the in the bound. Can you explain the what, what is the meaning of the constraint and, and why it's it's needed? Uh, uh, naturally, okay, so P is equal to Q, right? You have alpha equals one, but beyond that. What are cases where alpha would be very small, and why that's is that a, a problem? No, that's a good that's, that's a good point. Uh, let me one thing. Uh, look, I'm using I'm using a power, uh, but uh, anyway. Uh, let me just. Uh, Emil, tu peux apporter le, le chargeur? Le chargeur, oui. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, yes, so I think the first thing is that the whenever you want to estimate entropy, you always have an issue with the uh, with the density alpha. The density you always have to add one point to impose the lower bound alpha. 
I'll see it in the algorithm. And the key is the dependence on alpha. The key is the dependence on alpha. Uh, and, and so here, if a uh, uh, of the Q is, can be zero, you can add alpha, okay? And then you get a worse fight by optimizing the alpha uh, over there. Okay, so it's a classical way. The classical way of uh, of uh, dealing with it. Okay, so here I've not tried to optimize the alpha dependence, uh, but I know that that paper which I've mentioned, I think this one, they go at quite extreme lengths trying to take care of this like a uh, small alpha uh, thing. But that's, that's a good point. Uh, this uh, to estimate entropy, uh, uh, you need this alpha to be strictly positive, but keep in mind that this is a relative Q, okay? So if you have the good support, you're fine. But I agree this is like a limitation, but like all entropy estimation frameworks. Thank you, any other questions? Um, well, thank you again. Um, um, and will our first speaker, first contributed speaker come up? Um, so thank you again, Francis. And um, I guess while we're getting set up, if anyone does think of a question, uh, we can still, oh, we have a break? Oh, okay. Yeah, just here. Um, yeah, if, if uh, we will have a break till 11, and uh, if somebody wants to go out, you can go, uh, but do not engage with any of the protesters. If they try to engage with you or harass you, that maybe will be a good excuse that we get public safety here, but you can just inform the uh, organizers. Uh, we have a break till 11, and uh, we are sorry this was not part of the plan, but the event will go on. Great. Uh, and there is coffee, yeah. and just enjoy. Uh, Try to use some, you know, noise cancellation in your mind. Take care.
Excuse me. Uh, for those uh, uh, three presenters who are presenting in the next contributed talk session, can you please come up and just make sure that the eight, you know, that everything works? Um, uh, thank you.
All right, everyone, if we want to get seated, we could try to start the next uh, session. Let's try to continue with the conference despite the uh, interruptions. So if everyone wants to get seated, I'm not sure which side is quieter right now, um, but uh, it was this side. All right. OK, now this is off. Um, all right. So uh, while we all get seated, um, yeah, I'm not sure which side is quieter now, uh, but we will have three contributed talks this morning. Um, the first uh, is Simon Bombari from uh, IAT um, Austria, so, or IST, sorry, Austria. Um, so please, everyone, give him a hand. Hello. Hello. Uh, OK. Uh, thanks to everyone. Thanks for trying to be very focused despite the noise. And I will try to be as loud and clear as possible to make this work. OK, so uh, I will talk about my work on memorization optimization. This is a joint work with my friend uh, Mohamed Hossein and my supervisor Marco Mondelli. And just to give a brief introduction on something everyone is aware of, training neural networks is a non-convex problem with many disconnected local minima. Uh, however, we see that in practice, algorithms like gradient descent can achieve zero training loss. So why is this the case? Well. In a hand wavy fashion, we can say, yeah, we have many dimensions in these uh, high dimensional landscapes. So probably gradient descent can find its own way until getting to a global minimum. However, we would want to formally describe this in a less hand wavy manner. So there is a common recipe to deal with this problem, which is based on the neural tangent kernel. I'm not gonna introduce this object, and for the people that are not very familiar with this, just think about it as an object that describes our network up to the first order of its Taylor expansion. So you can write the Jacobian J of the network, which is n times p matrix. n is the number of samples, and p is the number of parameters. And you can build out of this, this empirical neural tangent kernel, which is n times n kernel. And, and again, number of training samples in our model. If we use a quadratic loss, we can write this uh, inequality, which is showing us already something very interesting. The smallest eigenvalue of this kernel can be used to lower bound the gradient of the loss. So we can already see intuitively that there are two things that we can prove to win this game. The first one is that the smallest eigenvalue of the neural tangent kernel is very separated from zero. And it also stays like that as we train our model. In this way, we would be able to provide results in optimization. So to recap, memorization optimization, this is the title of the work, because another result that we have almost for free as we study the smallest eigenvalue of the neural tangent kernel is that for whichever set of uh, n labels, I can find some uh, parameters such that we epsilon interpolate these points. And this follows the corollary of uh, the work on Montanari and Zong in 2020. The most interesting part is, however, related with optimization, as we're seeing and is, uh, follows the same line of uh, Ormec and Sultan Kutabi. And the question is, does gradient ascent converge to zero loss? And if we can show that, yes, indeed, the smallest eigenvalue is well separated from zero, this is alpha, and the Jacobian doesn't change too much as we train, then we have a geometric guarantee on the decay of the loss. And just to make you understand, this alpha shouldn't be something close to zero. Like, we really want the condition number of this kernel to be as low as possible. So this is the main problem. The main problem is under which settings the neural tangent kernel of a network is well conditioned. And this, this brings together with it other questions like, OK, is this, a is this a function of the activation function or the initializations that we're using? Or maybe the depth? 
data distribution or over parameterization. So you can think about it even as a practitioner, like, okay, what should I, how should I build my neural network in a way that this condition number is gonna be well behaved? Because this is something that we care if you want to optimize this network. And the last point is the most important and it's about over parameterization and to give you a very fast pictorial way of why this is, this is, this is the case, of course, if you are working with an underparameterized network, the kernel can be written in this form, and it's pretty easy to see that this is rank deficient. So the smallest eigenvalue of the kernel is gonna be zero. So we of course want to work in the settings where the network is overparameterized, because in this case, the matrix is gonna be made by this fat Jacobian, and in this case, we might have the situation where the smallest eigenvalue is larger than zero. It's not automatic, but this at least we know that we can do. And the question is, okay, how much should we be overparameterized? And the, the story is that the more overparameterized you are, the easier becomes the proof. And there is a line of work that progressively pushed down this necessary overparameterization. There is also work that recently achieved uh, tight overparameterization, so as soon as the ratio between the, over the parameters and the number of samples diverges, even very slowly, then we have that the smallest eigenvalue is larger than zero. However, this is done only on a two-layer network. And we would want to do this for deep networks. However, for the deep case, this is a streamline of work that I can show you that push down the width of the network. And as you can see, it's far away from this uh, optimal square root of n. And the last work achieves layers that scale linearly with the number of samples. So number of parameters scales at least quadratically uh, with the number of samples. And why do we want to get to minimal overparameterization? Like why, oh, this is louder. Okay, why do we want to get until this point? Well, I can show you a couple of examples based on two data sets. One is CIFAR10, the other one is a subset of ImageNet with this number of samples. We can check how big should be a network that has layers as wide as n and what is actually enough to fit completely the data points. And for CIFAR10, we have these number of parameters if we work with these wide networks, this is actually what is enough though. And for ImageNet, it's pretty more fun because this is more than probably the size of the largest transformer ever published so far. And this is actually the only thing that we need. So it's clear that quadratic is more than we need and we would want to achieve results in the minimal overparameterization settings, which is what we're doing. So this becomes the last open question and okay, is the NTK well condition for a deep network with minimal possible overparameterization. And I hope I gave you a sense of why this question is very important. And the main technical contribution is yes, under some uh, assumptions we can prove this and the smallest thing value scales as the number of parameters. So it's pretty large and well separates itself from zero. And just, just to mention this high probability is with respect to the input data because we are sampling points from some distribution and only on the initialization because I'm initializing my network in a random and pretty standard way. Another thing that I'm using is that the depth of the network is a constant. So when I write these scalings, these asymptotic scalings, I'm not taking into account large L. Okay, so let's dig into the math with a little bit of notation. I'm working with single output fully connected networks and the layer widths are gonna be indicated with these uh, small n's with the indices that represent my layer. And again, the, the depth of the network L is considered as a constant. So there are some mathematical equations that we can write using the chain rule, since the Jacobian is just the derivative with respect to the parameters of the output, which is this. The neural tangent kernel, JJ in transpose, can be written as the sum of these partial kernels. These partial kernels are one for each layer in my network. And these partial kernels can be written as this component-wise product, Hadamard product, between this term that represents the features, so basically what we have inside our neurons, and oh, I mean, and the backpropagation terms. Backpropagation is a little bit more difficult to explain, but just consider it as you know this uh, stack of derivatives with respect to every layer up to that point. So again, these subkernels are these component-wise product between the features from the left and the backpropagation terms from the right. I will focus on the penultimate layer because this penultimate layer is a little bit easier to study and as I said, I want a lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue of the NTK, but since the NTK is a sum of PSD terms, 
If I provide a lower bound of the smallest eigenvalue of this last term in this sum, then I'm done because all the other terms just bring some positive additional terms. If we focus on this uh, very last layer, then what happens? The Jacobian can be written, the rows of the Jacobian, sorry, can be written in this Kronecker form, where on the left in blue we have the features and in right we have the propagation term, which we can write explicitly in this way. These are the neurons up to layer L minus 2, and this is the propagation term that is written as activation, derivative of the activation times uh, penultimate layer times the neurons at layer L minus 2. Of course, if we work only on the penultimate layer to have smallest eigenvalue larger than zero, we need the number of parameters in this matrix, which is n times n, be larger than n. Otherwise, we're screwed because we wouldn't have a full rank matrix in this penultimate layer. I will give a very fast uh, high dimensional probability refresher. Hopefully, most of the audience is familiar with these notions. First of all, is the uh, sub Gaussian norm and also sub exponential norm. What is a sub Gaussian norm? Sub Gaussian norm is basically the standard deviation of the smallest Gaussian that can bound the tail of my random variable. And in an uh, in analogous way, I can also define the sub exponential norm, where we're not working with Gaussians but with exponential distributions. We can make the same definitions also for uh, vectors, where we project the vectors on uh, unit norm uh, vectors u beforehand. We can do this even for uh, sub exponential distribution. And there is one result which is maybe a little less known, which is the Hanson Ride inequality. This is very important for our proof. We really leverage on this tool, which is that if we have a vector x, which is sub Gaussian mean zero with independent entries, then this quadratic form made of this vector will be sub exponential. And the sub exponential norm is upper bounded by the sub Gaussian norm of the vector and the quadratic form you're using to r define this uh, big lambda object. Okay, so I told you, I want to understand the smallest eigenvalue of a matrix that is defined as this component-wise product between features and backpropagation. The problem is that these two terms, even looked singularly, are pretty complicated. So to get a little bit of intuition, let's work with something way easier. So instead of features and backpropagation, we look at x and y, where the entries of x and y are sub -Gaussian, independent, Gaussian, um, independent Gaussian random variables. Uh, what do we do? Okay, let's look at the rows of this Jacobian, Zi. Uh, it's written in this Kronecker form, and I can use a very fast answer right inequality to show that the sub-exponential norm of these rows is constant, so it's very small. Other very easy results on concentration of Gaussian vectors would give us that the L2 norm of these rows are very large, so they scale as the product of the number of columns of X and Y. And then we use the result of this work by Adam Chuck that says, okay, if there is a very large gap between the L2 norm and the sub-exponential norms of the rows, and this gap scales like the number of rows of the matrix, then we're done. Because ZZ transpose concentrates to the identity matrix times a factor that is exactly the L2 norm of the rows. So in the case where the number of columns of X and Y, the product between this number of columns is larger than the number of rows, we're good, we're done. Because the smallest eigenvalue of ZZ transpose concentrates to these uh, uh, NX and Y. And this is amazing, because if you look at this, this is exactly the minimum overparameterization requirement. Because the number of columns of X is exactly the width of the penultimate layer, and the number of columns of Y is exactly the width of the last layer. So it feels that this strategy and recycling these results from Adam Chuck and this answer right style of proof would give us exactly what we want. However, in reality, stuff is more difficult because first of all, the entries of F and B are not independent and actually F and B are dependent between each other. So this already makes the story more difficult. And the other thing is that their expectation is non-zero and this is critical for our proof. And because if we just look at the sub-exponential norm of these non-centered vectors, the sub-exponential norm would be very, very large. So we wouldn't be able to reuse these results. So what can we do about this? First of all, we can work, instead with sub-Gaussian input data, we can work with Lipschitz concentrated random variable. Because there is a result, uh, there is a more generalized version of Anson Wright inequality that allows us to use these a little bit stricter family than sub-Gaussian, but where we can relax the fact that the entries are uh, independent between each other. And to use this, 
for our feature and back propagation maps, we would just have to assume that the activation function is smooth. So this is the first assumption we use, that the activation functions are smooth. And what about the centering? This is much more painful. And to get an idea of what we can do about it, we just have to look at what kind of objects we like to use Anson right inequality. The objects are of this form. Y and X are mean zero, and then we subtract by the quadratic form the expectation of it. So instead of working with this, which is very annoying to me, I would want to work with something like this. So I subtract by the features the expectation, I subtract by the backpropagation part the expectation, and then afterwards I subtract everything from this. So these I define J tilde, which is the centered Jacobian. And of course, I want to provide lower bounds on the smallest eigenvalue of the Jacobian, not on the center Jacobian. So why this would be beneficial? Well, if we can prove that the original Jacobian is lower bounded in spectrum by this center Jacobian, then we're done. Because we just prove our bounds on J tilde, and then these bounds are going to be meaningful even for J. And this is exactly what we do in, uh, in a very long proof, but it works, or at least it should. So to recap, what is the sketch of proof? This is the neural tangent. The neural tangent is a sum of PSD terms. And so we can work only on the penultimate layer, which is the easiest for our purpose. This penultimate layer has the rows that can be written in this way, Kronecker form. This form is not Anson Wright friendly, so we center it. We show that the thing we want to prove the bounds on is lower bounded by this new object. We prove the concentration bounds on this new object, because now we can do, as I was saying in the easy case scenario. And this gives me a uh, matrix concentration on the centered kernel that is exactly scales as the number of parameters in the last layer. So this also gives me the smallest eigenvalue. So to conclude, what did we do? We provide a lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue of the neural tangent kernel for reasonable architectures. So not extremely weirdly overparameterized and deep. We connected this result with optimization, which is very important. And given uh, the line of work I was discussing about trying to push down the necessary overparameterization, we need to have these guarantees. This can be seen as an endpoint because this is the minimal overparameterization, and I showed you in the pictures. If we go below this point, of course, the, the, the smallest eigenvalue is going to be zero. And to mention some possible future works, uh, I just would want to stress the fact that the smallest eigenvalue of this kernel is not related only with optimization, but with many more things. Uh, and understa understanding other layers beside the very last layer, would be beside being mathematically interesting, could be very insightful for understanding the role of depth in these, uh, in these kernelized models. And an assumption that I didn't mention and is a little bit high that is that I require my network to not get too wider as I get deeper and deeper. And this we call uh, loose pyramidal topology, and this can be relaxed, but the price to pay is that we would have to use a higher degree of parameterization. So there is the feeling that there is a trade-off between the shape of the network that we're using and the overparameterization we need to have these guarantees. So this interplay, in my opinion, is extremely interesting. And to conclude, I would want to thank my two uh, co-authors. Uh, one is Mohamed Hussein in PFL, and the other one is my advisor, Marco Mondelli. And thank you all for uh, being uh, very focused, hopefully, especially in the first part. And uh, thanks again, and hope to see you around. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, thank, thank you. Very interesting talk. Um, and this seems like a very satisfactory result. Can you specify a little bit more? You said that this is an endpoint. So basically, you can show that this is separated from zero, the eigenvalue is separated from zero whenever um, um, it's overparameterized. You don't need any excess overparameterization. And also, what kind of architectures does it work for? I presumably, it also is, depends on the architecture of the network. Yes, thanks. Uh, so, OK, uh, I'm working with fully connected. And I'm working with uh, these, as I was saying, these loose pyramidal topologies. So the network does something like these as I get deeper and deeper. So if I need the last layer to be overparameterized, in some sense, I need every layer to be overparameterized. So these can be a little bit restrictive if we consider networks that get wider and wider and, str and stricter and stricter, but at least what we see in these uh, very plain uh, convolutional networks or uh, 
uh, fully connected network is that indeed the, ne the, the, the sides get sh uh, smaller and smaller as we get deeper. So there are not other hidden assumptions. We are working with initializations that are Lacoon initialization. So the weights are Gaussian, but I'm pretty sure this is just a way to make the proof easier. We can work even with uh, whichever distribution we like. The important thing is that the standard deviation of these initialization scales like the inverse of the d width of the layer that comes exactly before, which is, which is what is done in practice. So again, this should match. Uh, and besides these technicalities, I guess there is no hidden uh, weird trick to make this work. So for example, differently from the penultimate work in the line of research I was mentioning, uh, this uh, omega of n was using an initialization that was more artificial. They were really handcrafting the initialization to make this work. In our case, no, we use everything pretty standard. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Hi, I have two questions. The first one is um, you neglect all the other layers, and so how loose is the bound? And is it, do you think that most of it is in the last layer, or maybe not? Uh, very good question. Okay, uh, in, uh, we also prove an upper bound on the smallest eigenvalue. And if we imagine all the layers to scale with the same width, so let's say square root of n, square root of large n, then the bound is exactly tight because we, we show that there is, um, you know, the smallest thing value is omega of uh, uh, number of parameters and is also big O of number of parameters. So as I was saying again, uh, I will stress again this loose pyramidal topology. If the, the, the network is not constantly wide, then this might not be loose anymore just because these, uh, with this informal statement, this number of parameters is larger asymptotically than the number of parameters in the very last layer, because the very last layer is smaller. But in the moment where the last layer is not the smallest anymore, then everything becomes very tight. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, in order for the NTK regime to be valid, you need assumptions on initialization, the, the width needs to be very large. Um, in order for you to prove the lower bound, you also made assumptions. And maybe I misunderstood, but I think you said that the, the width couldn't be too large. So can you comment on whether the assumptions are consistent? No, okay. Uh, the width can be large. Like if the layers are super wide, then we know that uh, neural networks training matches with uh, the NTK learning. And we also know that our results hold for NTK. Like this is, I'm, I'm just putting lower bounds on the, on the width of the layers. And now in this setting, I'm proving this with a minimal width that would make this result true in NTK. One thing you can argue is that in this regime where the layers are only screwed off big N, the learning of the neural networks is not well represented by an NTK, uh, a kernelized NTK learning problem. But this is a, this is a complete another problem. Like uh, um, to, to, to connect our results with the optimization in real neural networks, we also enforce lazy training. So we do the game of splitting the things in the very last layer and proving that you know the, the training is lazy. But if you just look at the smallest eigenvalue problem, then uh, this, is, uh, this is consistent with itself. And it's a little bit besides the learning thing. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we move next to next speaker. So basically you showed that a neural network will you know, converge well because of this over-parameterization, so we go to into a higher dimension, which is somewhat intuitive. You know, when you go to higher dimensions, then well, you can drive your loss to zero. But then how good is your convergence point from generalizability, uh, let's say, for how, how good it is? Is it, okay, when you go in higher dimension, you're gonna converge, but how good is your convergence point in higher dimensions? Okay, uh, yes, in this work I didn't mention anything about the relation between the smallest eigenvalue and the generalization or whichever properties. I briefly mentioned in the future works is that this smallest eigenvalue and generally the spectrum of the NTK can be related with learning 
generalization, even robustness, for example, properties of the network. Intuitively, you can imagine that the condition number stretches your solution. Like if there is a parameter that has associated, so if there is a direction in the parameter space that has associated very small eigenvalue, we would have to go in that direction long time to, to fit in that direction. So this feels going against the weight, the, sorry, the L2 regularization because we're going very far in parameter space, which we can imagine is bad for generalization because we shouldn't explore too far. But there are works that do exactly generalization f with these uh, smallest eigenvalue. One is the two layers network that I was mentioning from Montanari and Zong. Uh, next up, we have uh, Boba Kiani from MIT, who will tell us about uh, joint embedding self-supervised learning uh, in the kernel regime. So, you can go first. Thank you so much. Um, welcome to my talk. This is uh, going to be joint work with people at Meta. Um, Randall, who's here as well, um, Yu Bei Chen, Seth Lloyd, my advisor, and Jan LeCun. So, the basic goal of this work is to take all these really uh, neat and interesting algorithms in the self-supervised learning uh, area of machine learning and translate them into kernel methods. Uh, just before I begin the talk, I will say this has a lot of nice ties to manifold learning, metric learning, um, things that we, I'm sure a lot of people here have used before in kernel methods. So we're looking at the joint embedding framework where the basic idea is you want to learn in an unsupervised fashion, but you have some information which relates um, images or inputs. So here we look at augmentations, and there's two different ways to do this type of learning. The first is contrastive, where you, um, you know, augment an image, and then you match the uh, representations for pairs that you know come from the same augmentation or same original image, and then you push away or um, contrast those that are uh, not related. And then uh, perhaps more recently, there's been a line of work that's uh, along the lines of non-contrastive methods where you also match representations, but you don't want to do any um, negative pairs. So instead, to avoid collapse, to avoid pushing everything to a constant, uh, these ideas maximize information. So they ensure that the uh, information of your representation is in some sense uh, not lost, and that avoids this collapse issue. Um, so, just to give a brief idea of how this works in deep learning, you have a original input, you uh, produce two different augmentations of it, or two different views of it, and then in the, um, you push these through your neural network, and then in the downstream task, you apply your loss function. Um, so, um, People here probably already know this, but uh, our goal is to take this whole idea and show that you can do a lot of the same techniques in the kernel regime. Um, instead of uh, using a deep network, we're here going to say we put our um, input and we do augmentations, wherever it may be, but then we embed it into some Hilbert space. Uh, and then we want to do everything inside that Hilbert space. We want to take these self-supervised learning algorithms and um, reproduce them uh, using techniques from kernel methods. Okay, um, so um, just to reiterate the point, you, uh, the main goal here is we wanna um, take our inputs, put them into Hilbert space, and then output some linear map from this Hilbert space into some representation space. Here, um, we treated that as R to the K, so the real, it's just a vector in K dimensions. Um, and then this produces a new um, induced kernel, which is the output of your self-supervised learning algorithm. Uh, and you can use this new, what we call induced kernel for whatever downstream task you'd like, um, be it uh, regression or classification, whatever uh, you may choose. So it, in a broad sense, our, our main goal is to just find what is this, uh, what we call this induced kernel or K star in my notation uh, that takes your uh, original kernel and does some, trains it on some self-supervised task and produces a new representation. Um, so uh, here's our kind of pipeline. So basically we have some set of data set, x1 to xn. We have some adjacency matrix which encodes the relationships between inputs. Here I've put a, a orange color wherever we know that two inputs are related by an augmentation. But you could be more broad, general than this. You could have some 
um, manifold of data and uh, you could maybe define a Laplacian or whatever it may be, these, these things also fit. Um, but here in the finite case, we have some input data set. We, we know relationships between the data that are encoded in this adjacency matrix. And we want to use this data to produce a new kernel. Uh, just to be very uh, precise, just for an example, you can um, look at this where you have two cats that are in your data set that come from the same augmentation. We make the adjacency matrix one where we know there's a relation. But we can be more general than this. We can also encode, you know, small values, smaller values than one. Um, for example, on the right-hand side, we, uh, you may know that two dogs are related but not exactly related. So you still want them to have some overlap but not fully overlapped. So you can also... Um, incorporate that in your data. Okay, so before we jump into um, any more details, I just want to go through some notation here because uh, it's easy to get lost in details without knowing the notation. So um, throughout, we'll use X to be our data matrix. This is all our inputs as some um, in some matrix. The, these result in representations, um, which we denote by Z. And then uh, in the output, we will have a kernel vector or a kernel matrix. Uh, and we'll just put a star on that, a k to the star, to indi indicate that we're using the induced kernel or the output of the uh, training after self-supervised learning. And then one uh, thing that we'll just note is if you see a plus as an underscript on a matrix, that's just projecting onto the uh, positive uh, uh, eigenspace. Okay, so to do this task, we're going to take three steps. Um, and these steps, I'm sure people are aware, are come in other kernel methods, but we'll, we'll follow the same direction. So uh, first, we're going to show that there is a, uh, in some cases, closed form solution. So there's a common form for this induced kernel. And then in some cases, you can find closed form solutions that tell you some nice things about um, the self-supervised learning. And then outside of these closed form settings will also show that you can often frame these problems as an optimization problem, um, sometimes in semi-definite programming. Okay, so uh, this probably isn't a surprise to anyone, but you, uh, in this case, will have a version of the representer theorem. So when you have a loss function of the form that we described here, which is some um, argument of your loss function plus a RKHS norm regularizer, then the solution will be of the form that we show below, um, where your induced kernel is basically some new matrix that's only a function of the kernel and the support of the data. Um, and this basically takes any uh, kernel problem and reduces it to an optimization task over your finite data set. Uh, so first, let me go through a couple uh, closed form solutions of this. So here, on, I will assume all the data is given as one batch, so your loss function is one huge uh, matrix norm, or in this case, a Frobenius norm over a big matrix quantity. Um, in this case, this is the uh, analog of the Vickreg loss, which is has two terms. The first term is a uh, term that enforces that your uh, matrix, your, your gram matrix, is as close as possible to identity, minus the, um, when you de-average it. And the second term enforces contrastive pairs. So it says that when there is some relationship between data points, we want them to be as close as possible. And what you'll see in the closed form solution for this that we show at the bottom, uh, you have the uh, kernels on the outside between two new data points in your data set. A S here denotes the data set. And then you have something in the middle which basically uh, enforces the information quantity and the contrastive pairs. And we'll come to some intuition for how this works, but you can see that the um, loss function basically, uh, the, the closed form solution tries to produce a, a solution which enforces both this information gain and the uh, contrastive pairs. Uh, similar for contrastive loss, I think this one is actually a lot simpler. Here, our goal is we want our kernel matrix to be as close as possible to what's given by the adjacency matrix, and as you'll see, it basically has a very simple form when you have one a data given as a single batch that you just invert your data in the data set and then you just want to make this as close as possible to i plus a. And that, as you see, is why it's in the middle of the, uh, of the two kernels. 
Um, so just to interpret this to give some intuition, um, here it's for the contrastive case if we are given two new data points, x and x prime. The uh, terms on the outside are sort of the closeness of your inputs, x and x prime, to the feature space of the SSL data set. And then the entry in the middle, the big matrix in the middle that I've uh, outlined in orange here enforces the, uh, uh, the terms related to the contrastive terms. So it makes things close together when they should be and otherwise uh, not close together. And if people are familiar with ideas in metric learning, you'll, you'll see similar forms as well in, in that literature. Um, so before we, we had closed form uh, solutions when we trained over a single batch of data, but uh, you can also write your loss function as a function over many batches of data. Here we couldn't find a closed form solution, but we did note that you can write uh, this as a semi-definite program, as an SDP. I give the form below here for the contrastive loss. Uh, I don't have much more to say on this other than you can potentially solve this or use uh, tricks to analyze it, but uh, we just couldn't really find a closed form solution other than this. Okay, uh, so running to experiments now. Uh, we wanted to first, before we do any experiments on uh, larger data sets, we want to look at what happens when we use these kernels on a simple problem. And here we look at two spiral data sets. People typically use this as a classification problem, but we simply just said, let's see what happens when we use uh, the kernel and look at the induced kernel after we uh, look at this on a spiral data set. And I'm sorry if this is a bit blurry, but we're basically calculating the kernel between the points marked with the green X and other points in the data set. And as you'll see, if you use a typical RBF kernel, uh, without any SSL training, you have correlations that are close in the uh, R2 space. But when you do SSL, the induced kernel, you'll see that there's correlations picked up along the manifold of the data. Um, on the right-hand side, we, we use the bad augmentation. We, we, uh, we, the augmentations here are basically Gaussian noise, so we try to we correlate points that are close together in some region, in some ball. And you'll see that if you make that ball too big, then it doesn't really work. So um, just gave an example of how the augmentation is crucial to the performance of this. Um, sorry, just, just one point, and I'll come back to this later. This, there's a hypothesis in SSL that uh, uh, the augmentations create some manifold along the data, and this is part of the reason why SSL works so well. So this is uh, one, I guess, visual example of where we can see this in two dimensions. Um, so jumping into some very simple generalization analysis, uh, many quantities in uh, generalization in kernel methods is related to the norm of your solution in the RKHS norm. And we decided to see uh, if uh, analyze this quantity here, which is related to that norm, which is we call um, SNK, which is basically a complexity quantity that you can be used to uh, bound generalization. And we wanted to see if uh, how this picture affects this uh, quantity is complexity quantity. And again, going back to the idea here, this quantity, if, if you uh, believe this manifold hypothesis, this quantity is uh, minimized or made very small when the SSL kernel uh, correlates things that are, uh, that are on the same manifold. So if you have augmentations that produce some manifold of the data via those augmentations, if the induced kernel can capture those correlations, then this complexity quantity will be very small because it also will correlate things along the labels as well. Um, and just as a way to formalize this, uh, there's a very simple proof behind this, but if you have, uh, here we say if we have M negative one and M plus one manifolds in a binary classification setting, if the SSL induced kernel does what I just said, which is that it correlates points along manifolds and otherwise does not, so it sets the induced kernel to one when it's on the manifold and zero otherwise, and this complexity quantity is order one, which is in a sense optimal. And uh, we don't have any proof that this is like the data in the real world does have this form. I think that's some of the future work we'd like, but just to give you, we, we just wanted to say this to formalize some of the intuition behind why uh, such ideas that we have would, we'd expect to hold true. 
So jumping to some, uh, before I finish, jumping to some experiments that we did on, uh, here it's on MNIST. So kernel methods, we looked at the small data set samples of MNIST and then produced augmentations of that data set. And we compared the uh, induced kernel to uh, s regular supervised training with or without these augmentations included. And what you'll see is that the performance is, you know, often in line or sometimes even better than the uh, supervised baseline. Of course, uh, the augmentation, though, matters. Uh, at the top here, we did a very bad augmentation, bad in the sense that it doesn't really work well with image data. And you'll note that the uh, induced kernel doesn't perform as well. Um, there's similar results for uh, convolutional neural tangent kernels. The previous slide was for RBF kernels, uh, but similar findings as well if you do um, other types of kernels. And finally, coming back to this generalization, this complexity quantity, uh, we also see that this uh, self-supervised learning induced kernel does reduce this complexity quantity. I apologize, it's really hard to read this slide, but basically the, the point is that when you have the right hyperparameters, this quantity is, in a sense, uh, made very small, at least in comparison to the supervised baselines. So it may um, give one indication for the success of self-supervised learning in the kernel regime. Uh, I'd just like to end by thanking my co-authors. Um, thank you guys for listening to my talk. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Um, what we got? Yes, sir. Oh, oh yeah. Um, um, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, how do, how do these results compare to some, um, you know, to the, all the semi-supervised learning algorithms, Laplacian-based and other things like that? Yeah, um, I think much of the proof ideas and the techniques are shared. Um, I, our goal was to take those ideas and put them into the modern framework of self-supervised learning. From an empirical perspective, we didn't uh, compare much to those methods, but uh, our, our hunch is that they would perform probably better if not similar. Um, yeah. Our goal really was to like focus truly on the deep learning regime where these people, people use this SSL for these deep networks. Thank you. Any more questions? I feel like I could hear myself now, so it's, uh, I forgot about the mic. Um, <laughs> uh, for our final talk uh, for the morning session, um, I'm pleased to have Nikhil Ghosh uh, from UC Berkeley, so thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so you can hear me. All right, so yeah, this is joint work with uh, Misha, who's here as well. So I want to start by uh, pointing out an interesting phenomenon that uh, many others have noticed in the past as well, which is that uh, in deep learning, you see that models that are trained to near zero loss on noisy data can still generalize relatively well. And the question is, uh, why doesn't this uh, noise lead to uh, horrible overfitting? And so, uh, recently, uh, people have done theoretical work to show that um, instead you see this um, benign overfitting and you can show this holds uh, for linear regression, random features regression, and kernel methods. And kind of the intuition is that um, you learn these sort of spiky plus smooth models and these spikes that come from overfitting have a uh, small volume and high dimension, which leads to not hurting the, the test error so much. And what these works show is that benign overfitting happens in special situations, and they require uh, specific conditions on the algorithm and the data distribution. 
But one thing that seems to always be true is that you need to be uh, heavily overparameterized. And so my question is, is, is this somehow fundamental to this, to this phenomenon? And so uh, what we show in this work is that, at least for linear predictors that are fitting the training data below the noise level, they must be significantly overparameterized to generalize well. And this is true essentially no matter what the algorithm or the data distribution is. And so to, to make these uh, notions more precise, uh, we'll consider the squared loss, so the squared training loss, and uh, the squared test loss. And in this setting, um, the optimal predictor for the test loss is just given by the conditional mean. And so uh, to evaluate the predictor, a natural quantity to consider is the excess loss. So it's test loss compared with the, the optimal loss. And the models we'll consider are these uh, linear feature models, uh, which are linear pred predictors on top of a feature map. And so for example, we can just consider as in vanilla linear regression, just um, the identity function, or more generally, we could consider something like uh, a random feature map. And so given a feature map, uh, we can define the feature matrix from the data, and we'll say that the feature map is non-degenerate if this feature matrix has full rank almost surely. And uh, an important definition is this notion of tau overfitting. So we'll say that an algorithm A is tau overfitting if given a data set, it outputs a linear predictor such that its training loss is at most tau times sigma squared. And so here we can sort of think of uh, tau as uh, the loss uh, normalized by the noise level. And if tau is less than one, then that's what we mean by fitting below the noise level. And just to note that uh, a lot of the theoretical work on benign overfitting uh, only considers interpolating predictors like the minimum norm solution, which has uh, tau equal to zero. But in practice, tau will always be greater than zero because we'll early stop and never really fit to exactly zero loss. And so uh, now our main result is that if the feature map is non-degenerate and there's uh, noise in the problem, that is the conditional variance is at least sigma squared, then the expected excess loss is at most this quantity um, sigma squared n over p times one minus square root tau quantity squared. So just to reiterate, on the left-hand side, this is the expected excess loss. And then on the right-hand side, we have the number of data points, the number of parameters, and then this parameter tau. And what this uh, result is saying is that uh, if we're fitting below the noise level, that is if tau is less than one, then we need overparameterization beyond just uh, enough to fit the data in order to have low expected loss. And just to note, we're uh, restricting to tau um, being at most one, because if tau is greater than one, then the optimal predictor is um, admissible and it, it achieves excess loss equal to zero and training loss sigma squared. So now to kind of uh, unpack some, some consequences, um, if we want some uh, rate on the excess loss, that's something like n to the minus alpha, then what this bound is saying is that either two things happen. Either um, we're fitting very close to the noise level, that is like tau is almost one, or we must be in this so-called modern regime where we're uh, heavily overparameterized. So the previous uh, bound was uh, non-asymptotic and uh, independent of the distribution, but we can uh, have a sharper analysis by making some distributional assumptions and looking at asymptotics. In particular, we'll look at Ga Gaussian-like data. So the setting here is that the data is Gaussian, and we're in this 
asymptotic limit with n and p going to infinity at some ratio gamma, and that the true model is linear with some additive noise. And here we can define a special quantity, the minimum excess loss, which is um, exactly the minimum excess loss of a linear predictor subject to this uh, training loss constraint. And then in the asymptotic regime, we can define an analogous asymptotic quantity, this epsilon star of tau gamma. And we can show that um, under this uh, Gaussian assumption, uh, we essentially have that the, from the Marchenko-Pasteur law that our universal bound becomes tight uh, when, we, when we're heavily over-parameterized. Um, so this minimum error becomes exactly the bound that we had earlier, sigma squared n over p times uh, one minus root tau squared. Uh, and in this figure, I've um, kind of plotted for various values of, of tau. Um, in the solid line, the, the exact value of this minimum error, and then in the dashed line, the, the lower bound. And you can see that uh, once p over n is, is large, uh, the bound becomes tight. So yeah, as I just mentioned, the, the general bound becomes tight in this uh, over-parameterized regime, um, but it can be improved when we're closer to the interpolation point, um, and in particular, exactly at the interpolation point when p equals n, um, the minimum error scales something like uh, one over tau. Um, but just to raise a point, uh, even though this uh, peak is very interesting mathematically um, in this like sort of double descent phenomenon, uh, in practice, uh, observing a peak is, is very fragile. And part of the reason is that the peak behavior is uh, very sensitive to regularization. Um, so if uh, we increase tau just a little bit from, uh, from zero, then uh, in fact, instead of having uh, one over zero blowing up, we get something finite. Um, whereas when we're in the tail where uh, P is much bigger than N, there's much less sensitivity to this parameter tau since one minus root tau squared doesn't vary as much. Um, and just to put some, some numbers, like in practice we can imagine tau being something like 0.5 and in that case uh, this one minus root tau squared factor is 0.7 and so this is essentially almost the same as having tau equals zero and so an interesting consequence is that even if we just fit slightly below the noise level we still have the same consequences as if we were um, interpolating exactly with tau, tau equals zero. Um, yeah, and this figure just kind of uh, illustrates some of the quantities I was talking about where really it's this second tail in the descent which is interesting since that's where we can um, hope to get good, good performance. Yeah, and just to finish off uh, and summarize, uh, what we showed is that there's this uh, universal lower bound on the excess loss of linear predictors which fit noisy data. And we showed that this um, bound actually becomes tight uh, in this uh, asymptotic setting with Gaussian data when we have, when we're in this tail of the double descent with over-parameterized models. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any questions in particular, any trainee staff questions? Yeah. I'm just wondering why why did your your bound depend on the interpolation? Isn't it that there should be a, a better estimator that will not depend on this uh, like interpolation peak? Um, sorry, I didn't quite understand. The because point. you're saying that uh, 
like you can predict with a bound the, the interpolation regime when n is equal to p. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it means that the estimator that you're considering is not the right one. So, so, so isn't it that your bound should not depend on that? Or it's just because you are limiting yourself to this, to this uh, space of uh, estimators? Uh, right, yeah, so the, uh, the interpolation regime, yeah, I'm restricting to estimators where p equals n, and what the bound is showing is that like, if p is equal to n, then no matter what you do, you, like, you're going to have very bad error. So this is just another way of saying that you don't want to be, you don't want to estimate with p equal to n. You want p to be much bigger than n. Or, or that there is another estimate, or that will be better. I mean, you don't know that. When p equals n, there's like no estimator that's good. That, that's the point. No, because you, is, you, you uh, consider only this uh, set of functions. So there might be another one that will be better. When, when p equals n? Like, yeah. or So the claim is just that if p equals n, like any estimator will have at least uh, th that that error. Like it it doesn't. It's independent of what what uh, this is like an algorithm independent uh, lower bound. Like if if you're if you fit below the noise level, you will like incur a penalty, no matter what you do. Like, however you got to that, uh, th that solution, that's... That no, that I understand. It's just that for me, it's weird that, uh, that you have this... I mean, I, I think it depends on the space of the function that you consider, on, on the set of estimators that you consider. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, the only assumption is just that the, it's like this linear mm -hmm. uh, predictor and... Yeah, that's, that's about it, and that the features are full okay. rank, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so, so and, uh, of course, yeah, we, there needs to be noise. That's what I mean, like, you, if you fit noise, then, then you'll uh, have, a, have this bound. So, but do you think that if you will take a nonlinear uh, set of estimator, then you might have no interpolation, or, or is it? Um, I, I think maybe under like some more assumptions that even nonlinear predictors would have some penalty for, uh, for this sort of thing, but um, y yeah, because basically the problem is that you'll have very bad conditioning if your data and number of parameters is the same, and if you are poorly conditioned and you fit noise, then bad things happen, I think. That's okay, thank you, thank you yeah. very much. Yep. Next question. Thanks, Nikhil. Uh, so does this linear feature model include neural networks as well, where P is like the last layer, the width of the last layer? and then you have some dense layer at the end. Yeah, so it'll hold, I think, if uh, you consider a random neural network at initialization. But I think after training, you may not have this uh, like non-degenerate assumption necessarily. Like the feature map might become low rank uh, and, and, and not full rank, so. Sorry, what is that assumption? I, oh, I guess I'm just not remembering it. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, this is the assumption that, um, so capital fee is like the feature matrix, and what I mean by non-degenerate is that this feature matrix has full rank. Um, so I think a trained neural network, what I'm saying is just that like the um, the feature matrix might not exactly have a full rank, but I think basically the same result will hold. Just instead of P, you like replace 
by the rank of the features. And so that, that should still hold for like neural nets. So this is, um, this rank is the like discrete rank. So it seems like yeah. kind of weird, like if you just train a neural network somehow. Yeah, that's actually... true, yeah. So yeah, I guess, yeah, maybe even if you just train a neural network, this, sh this should still be true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I guess my follow-up now that you bring this up is, uh, what is this, what does this assumption mean actually? Sorry, what is what I don't I, I uh, am struggling to interpret this assumption. Like, just is there like a quick one sentence? Like, what this oh, non-degenerate this, this non-degenerate assumption? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's just saying that like, uh, if I look at my data points, they're not going to you're not going to have like them lying in a lower dimensional subspace than the number of data points you have. Like, if I have uh, three random data points, they're not gonna lie in a two-dimensional subspace. Yeah. Gotcha, thanks. So, uh, yeah, this brings the end of the session and uh, lunch is ready. Everything. Thank you. And thank you all for your uh, patience through this morning. Yeah, we have, Once again. we have lunch. Thanks. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah.